Hi everyone, Dan Gunner from Insane Forensics. Welcome back to Tech Talk Tuesday, where every week we try to give something to help your threat hunting and security program. And today what we're going to dive into is how to use the Windows event logs to locate malicious file share activity. So let's hop right into it. So why does network share, why does file share auditing matter? Um, if you look at MITRE ATT&CK, whether it be on the enterprise side or the industrial side, MITRE ATT&CK for ICS, what you'll see is a lot of techniques that are either focused on lateral movement, on getting access, on uh, messing with content on the share itself. And so as we look at why this technique matters and why this behavior matters and why auditing file shares matter, it's really because it, this is often a core part of just about every major group's operation. So starting with T1039, data from the network share drive, um, you have big groups like APT28 that collect data from network share drives. You have you know, groups like MenuPass that also collect data using things like NetUse. These are tools that are built in or commands built in, um, and even other tools like RoboCopy. When you get into lateral movement, you have examples of things like Locker Gaga um, transferring files over SMB, right? So when we talk network shares, a lot of times if it's Windows, SMB is the actual protocol under the hood that's um, initiating and handling that file share there. Even big groups like Sandworm, the Sandworm team move, uses network shares to move um, files over you know, network shares also. Finally, the last one we're going to look at here is um, Taint Shared Content, so T1080. Um, you have ransomware, so Conti spreads via infected network share drive files, right? So they'll hop on a share, um, make a file to where it infects everyone else, wait for people to open that file, and they'll use that to move across the network. Going back all the way even to Stuxnet for an industrial example, um, Stuxnet actually did infect database and also infected files that were on shares to propagate around. So again, network shares are a really good watering hole for a lot of networks um, or to gain access to other boxes that you might have to wait for a user to actually initiate on, but the network share is a core component. So it's important to audit these because this is, like we said, a watering hole oftentimes that all attackers will use to move laterally. So how do we use event logs to audit network shares? So luckily in the advanced audit policy in Windows, we have um, quite a few events here that we can enable. These aren't enabled by default. We'll talk a little bit next slide on how you enable these, but this is the level of granularity we can get down to on Windows. So under file share auditing, you have things like share was access. This is logged both on success and failure. You have add, modify, and delete. Those are logged on success. And then you have that the SMB check failed for SMB or SMB2, the SPN check. Um, this is part of the authentication. So if a user tries to connect over to a network share, share and it fails, you're going to get a 5168 event. We'll talk about this event more in details later. On the detailed side, you have 5145 that a share object was checked for access. This happens both on the success and failure condition. So again, you'll see this anyone, anytime someone's trying to enumerate your shares also, even if they don't successfully do it. The SPN is the service principal name. We'll talk about that a little bit when we get to that event log. But the point here is to show that there's a lot of options in the Windows event log when you're looking at network shares of the type of behaviors and events you can look for. And again, these have to be enabled by you. These aren't enabled by default, and so whether you do it via local policy or group policy, which we'll talk about here in a minute, um, it's important to know you do have to turn these on, and you also can tune them, which is super helpful, particularly if you're on a loud network or you want to get rid of uh, false positives. <clears throat> so how do you enable these? So these must be configured locally or via domain policy. So on the right, um, we show opening the start menu and looking for a local security policy. This will set it on a particular machine. Um, so if you want to do this on the domain controller, if you want to do this on a given workstation, you can do this granularity at that level, granularly at that level. If you want to set it across your domain, that's when you're going to set it as a group policy. 
And you can either send it to a subset of hosts in your domain or hosts or servers, or you can set it to your whole domain or groups of users and all that. Um, but the thing to point out here is this setting has to be configured either locally or via domain policy. So hopping right into events, we're going to start with 5140. This is generated on the first share attempt access. This is one that also is logged both in the success and failure condition. And so we'll see this in a brute forcing case, even when an attacker can't get in, or if an attacker has cred, something like uh, um, ransomware, a lot of times we're right. Attackers will take Mimi cats, they'll use the creds that they've harvested out. Um, they might use those creds then to map SMB shares to push malware over to use other commands. What you're going to see in here is you'll see the account name, security ID, object type. Big one, you'll see the source IP. You'll see the share name and share path. This can be super helpful as you're trying to get granular, maybe down to a specific application or to a specific file write, maybe into you know, the temp directory, into Windows System 32, something you shouldn't expect. And then also the access types. So the monitoring that Microsoft recommends here is they recommend, first of all, looking at high value shares on computers, right? So look for access to the C dollar sign folder or sysvol on domain controllers, right? You might also do this on production servers. You might do this on other, you know, very important hosts on your network. Um, but the thing to look for here is again, you can define high value for you. You know that context. Your high value might not be the same as your neighbor or friend's high value. The other thing we can look at, we talked about source IP, our external source IPs. So if you do this over the internet, if you have SMB exposed out to the internet, which some people unfortunately do, you can use this log to see, hey, I see people either successfully or they're failing, but they're trying to connect in to my network shares, right? Um, again, you might see an internal source IP address also that's suspicious, right? Maybe in one subnet of your network, you have a server set up with a file share, and maybe you see a connection from another subnet that shouldn't interact with that subnet, right? This is where context becomes really important, both when you're thread hunting or when you're doing instant response. Finally, access types. The access type tells you what they attempted to do or what they were trying to do. So is it a read? Is it a write? Um, Microsoft does have more access types in the documentation down at the bottom. So definitely check those out. Um, but access types, another one to know, hey, do I normally see reads, um, just file reads? Do I normally see writes? What is the typical behavior I see from host to host or from subnet to subnet? This really helps you narrow down to that activity that you see. So 5142, this is generated on success and specifically when a share object is created. Um, again, this includes things like the name, ID, object type, source IP, share name, and share path. And what Microsoft recommends here is looking for rights to high value computers, right? Again, this might be domain controllers. This might be a web server. If someone's trying to write a web shell and you have your web server's HTTP directory shared over SMB for some reason, Someone might try to write a web shell right into that web server's directory so then they can gain access um, or have other ways to get into that box, right? Um, high value or su suspicious paths, again, on this, creating files, so system32, um, oftentimes temp, like we said, IIS directories. Um, if it's a web server, the, and that's the directory that Windows Server is hosting the actual pages out of. Um, as you understand the environments that you're protecting and you're hunting in, you know, understanding what suspicious is really will help here. 5143, this is generated on modification, right? This could potentially be a loud one that you have to narrow down or you have to filter down a bit. Luckily, this is only logged on successful object modifications, right? But again, what we have are the fields we talked about, source IP, all of who accessed it, share pass, share name, access types. The nice other thing here is we have old and new fields um, depending on the field that's modified. So we can actually see granular down what fields are being changed. 
Um, what Microsoft recommends, obviously, again, is high value shares on this again, right? Um, is it the you know high value parts of domain controllers? Are these folders that generally shouldn't be written to, um, or that a user really wouldn't understand, right? Um, you know, why would random user write to C dollar sign on a domain controller and modify a file? 5144, this is when you're looking for deletion off. Maybe this is something ransomware is doing. Maybe it's malicious insider. You know, maybe it's associated with an attacker covering their tracks, right? This is logged on successful object deletion. Um, again, you're going to have the name, domain, login ID, um, security, um, and you're going to have the IP and then the path of this, right? Um, the recommended monitoring here is, um, you know, again, looking for modifications to files and folders that shouldn't be modified, right? On given servers, right? Like we said, again, you might also look for this one to say, hey, let me look for someone trying to delete a massive amount of files on, you know, a large number of hosts in a short period of time, right? Generally, users won't do that. Um, you might find a reason or an edge case they will, but again, under general user behavior, you can look for what looks weird with the deletion. 5168, so we talked a lot about adding, modifying, and deleting. What we're going to talk about now is the authentication side. So 5168, this is generated when authentication fails or when that service principal name, when that validation actually fails there. So again, we have the account name, we have the source IP, we have that service principal name, um, and we have the error code so we can see why it fails, right? Was the account logged, you know, was this corrupt? Um, you can see again to see, hey, is this brute forcing? Um, what is this behavior potentially tied to? And again, this is one to where if you have a lot of these in a short period of time, this event ID can either help you narrow down to a source IP that an attacker might be on, or just see, hey, I need to do more incident response. I need to do more analysis of my network to figure out why suddenly there's a bunch of, you know, authentications failing here. You can also do this on high value hosts, right? Um, and you also should look, Microsoft says, hey, look at all events related to corruption or malicious events. So this is the more granular one we'll look at. Um, 5145, this is generated both on success and failure. This is, I think, what they call more of an advanced share audit. Um, this is generated on every access attempt. So this is going to be a very loud one because remember, it's both success and failure. But the nice thing here is, right, you have that source IP, you have all the information of who's connecting, you have the share, you have the access mass, the list, the reason. Again, what you can look for here is who's actually trying to attempt to connect, right? Is this an external source IP that really shouldn't do it? Some of the environments we work in, they'll have like partnerships or business relationships between groups. You'll often see, hey, okay, partner X is trying to connect in and they have a reason to do that. Um, that would be an example where you might have a source IP that's explained, but if you can't explain why a source IP is accessing a share, you know, it might lead to, hey, we need to look deeper in this and hey, we also probably need to check our firewall rules because, you know, again, allowing SMB in um, without good reason is a very, very dangerous thing. Um, and so that's definitely something also to know just from a network posture, a security posture, something you can look at there, right? Unexpected source IP, right? Access to those critical shares. Another thing they say is account usage, right? So do I suddenly see an administrator account connecting in from the outside, right? Do I see an administrator account connecting from a host that administrator accounts don't usually come from, right? That can be a sign that again, maybe someone actually harvested your credentials and they're using SMB and you're seeing it in this specific log. Suspicious access reasons too, so reads, writes, deletes, appends. Um, looking for these again, right? Because across some network boundaries and host to host, you might begin to understand a pattern of why hosts talk on your network and what they typically do. And so again, if you begin to see things outside of what that expected norm is, 
Um, this is an area where you can say, okay, well, something's off here. Something changed in the relationship of what these two hosts or subnets generally do. This account or this event ID can help you get really down to that level to understand that. So thanks for tuning in today. What we talked about was network shares. We talked about how you can audit them with the Windows event logs. We talked about some of the scenarios um, you should look for and why it matters. We hope this talk today was helpful for you. Um, if it is, let us know. If you have ideas or things you want us to talk about, also let us know. And we hope to see you back next week. Thank you for tuning in.